Okay. okay. Perfect. So everyone can return to their seats. Uh, we'll get we'll get started. So I I don't think uh, Congressman Waxman needs much in, uh, much of an introduction. So I'll, I'll keep things short. But we are we are so honored to have him here uh, as our featured speaker uh, to talk about these uh, incredibly. Uh, interesting and, and important upcoming telecom uh, technology and media roles. Congressman Waxman um, has been an incredible member of Congress uh, since 1975. He's been chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee and has uh, conducted oversight and produced a tremendous wealth of legislation in a variety of areas. Uh, not just telecom, uh, but healthcare and energy as well. And he's just the incredible human being. And with, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Con Congressman Waxman. And uh, we're so, so, so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Teddy Downey, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to be with you today. This is probably the last speech I'm going to be give as a member of Congress, because uh, I've already cast my last vote, and I've already moved out of my office. I've been kind enough to uh, be accepted without argument to take my staff office. Otherwise, they give members a little cubbyhole to finish up uh, for the year, and I'll be off the payroll on January 2nd. So before I leave, I'm delighted to have this chance to talk to you about uh, communications policy. I think it's an exciting time to be involved in communications issues. Uh, today's debates about uh, video, net neutrality, major mergers don't just make the headlines in Washington, D.C. They're part of a national conversation about the future of our economy. And unlike many challenges facing the Congress today, uh, there's a widespread and bipartisan interest in the same goals. In fact, the legislation that has been adopted by the Congress in the communications areas area has, has been bipartisan. We all want America to continue to lead the world in innovation and technology. We agree that broadband internet access is now a basic prerequisite for participation in American society, and we want to foster a competitive environment that creates even more investment and choices for the American consumers. Demand for high-speed broadband has never been greater. Schools and libraries need high-capacity connections to take advantage of digital learning opportunities. Small business owners need access to world-class networks to compete in a global economy. And American families want faster connections to take advantage of all the new services that can be delivered over a broadband pipe. But the majority of American households only have a choice between two fixed broadband providers at best. In rural areas, they enjoy even less competition for both wired and wireless broadband, and nearly a fourth of these Americans don't even have basic broadband services. At the higher speeds needed to access high-definition video and connect multiple devices, choices are even more limited. Gaining access to over-the-top video services is a key reason that Americans are demanding better and faster broadband. Online distributors like Netflix and Amazon are not only offering consumers new choices in how they uh, access video content, they are creating original programming for writers, actors, and the creative community in my, what has been my congressional district. And around the country, online platforms are an important new avenue for distributing their work. 
add these new over-the-top competitors into the video marketplace along with free over-the-air broadcasters, pay television services from cable, satellite, and even traditional telephone companies, and it's no wonder we are in the midst of a new golden age for video. The rise of online video also raises important questions for Congress and regulators. First and foremost is the debate about how to best protect a free and open internet where consumers have unfettered access to the content of their choosing. The Federal Communications Commission has been grappling with this issue for nearly a decade since the decision to classify broadband as a more lightly regulated information service under Title I of the Communications Act. I worked to find a legislative solution to protect the open Internet after the Comcast decision in 2010. At the time, I couldn't convince my Republican colleagues to settle this issue in the law, but the compromise rules from my legislation, no unjust and unreasonable discrimination, a no blocking rule for wireline providers, a lighter touch, no blocking rule for uh, wireless and transparency requirements became the basis for the FCC's open internet order in December 2010. We wanted to pass the legislation, we couldn't, but basically the legislation became the basis of the FCC's order. Earlier this year, the Verizon decision threw out the FCC's ability to protect consumers and innovators online into question again. And I wrote the FCC recently to propose this last fall a hybrid approach that would reclassify broadband as a telecommunications service and then use the modern authority uh, recognized by the court in Section 706 to set these bright line rules. A month later, the President Obama called on the FCC to adopt these same three cornerstones of a free and open internet. No blocking, no throttling, and no paid prioritization. No blocking means that your broadband provider can't prevent you from accessing video or on Hulu or YouTube. No throttling means that your broadband provider can't slow down or degrade access to a service like Netflix. And no paid prior, prioritization means that the internet can't be carved up into fast and slow lanes where an innovative new video service or their customers would have to pay a toll. Uh, I have urged the FCC chairman to act and quickly to do so to adopt these common sense rules. Millions of individual Americans have contacted the FCC with the same message, and I believe the agency is poised to act early next year. The FCC has many other big ticket items to address next year as well, including the proposed mergers between Comcast and Time Warner Cable and between AT&T and DirecTV. These deals raise important concerns about the state of competition in an increasingly converged communications marketplace. These deals could have a lasting impact on the broadband market as well as how video programming is produced, distributed, and consumed across multiple platforms. These changes in the communications marketplace are also causing Congress to consider whether it's time to revise the Communications Act. At the end of last year, my Republican colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee announced an interest in revisiting our nation's communications laws. For any such effort to succeed, it will have to have bipartisan support and involvement from the very start. And I believe Democrats can and should be open to removing legal barriers to the kind of competitive environment we all envision. But technological innovation doesn't change our values and regulatory intervention may continue to be necessary to protect what the market may never demand. That's the uh, overall landscape. Of course, nothing much is going to happen uh, the end of this year. The year is almost up. 
But I think January and beyond will be interesting to watch how the FCC acts, how the Congress may proceed, it, uh, if it is able to proceed with a, a revision of the, uh, of the uh, Communications Act. Uh, next year will be an exciting time. So those of you who are involved in the industry, one way or the other, uh, will have a lot to keep you on your toes. And I think the American people have been stirred like very few other issues have uh, on the open internet, uh, uh, the open internet question. So with that, uh, let me take a few questions and then we'll all go on our way for the rest of the uh, conference and the rest of the year. Yes. What do you think is, uh, do you think there's a real chance for uh, a telecom rewrite next Congress? And any ideas on uh, uh, what you think, how, they, how you think that'll play out? Well, we have such a convergence of, in the industry that we've seen um, the rules in the Communications Act applied to, let's say, cable and others treated differently when so much of it is all now being uh, very, very mixed together. So I think there's an argument to be made for revising the Communications Act. I remember uh, when this was first talked about um, in the 70s, and it finally led to the revision in 1986. It was, it was 1996, so it doesn't happen overnight, but it's uh, possible, and to do it will require a lot of work on a bipartisan basis, but that's not so difficult on these issues as it seems to be on environmental issues, on health issues, on economic issues, where the partisan divide is so strong that it's been uh, uh, difficult to bridge some of these differences. So I think there's a chance, but we'll have to wait and see. I've got another question. No other questions in the audience? Yeah, one, one more over there. Uh, one more. Congressman, over there. Oh, sorry, I was around in '96, uh, but the um, and what you said about these being usually bipartisan issues is true, but on the issue of net neutrality, it's not. So, is there any realistic thought that they could rewrite the '96 Act and not touch net neutrality? Well, uh, it, it that would be a real sticking point. The FCC, I expect, will adopt a, a, a net neutrality rule. Undoubtedly, that will be challenged. Whatever they do will be challenged in the courts. But I think they have a pretty much of a roadmap from the last court decision that made clear the FCC has a legal authority to move in that area. And I think it suggested using Title II in some way in order to accomplish the legality of that revision. Um, if the Republican approach is to repeal that, uh, that, that uh, rule, I think it would be very difficult. That is not going to be met with bipartisan support, nor I think will be met with any public support, which is so strongly for net neutrality. But there are other issues, and there can be a rewrite of the act without that being uh, re resolved. But perhaps maybe even then it could be resolved, given the fact that we start with the status quo being what the FCC will decide on a majority basis. Yes, over there. Two, two sort of related questions. <clears throat> One, um, you're leaving the Congress, so you probably have the uh, latitude to answer this. Um, <laughs> besides the two chairs of the subcommittees, uh, Walden and Eshoo, who do you see in the Congress to be the leaders, um, either on a telecom rewrite or, you know, uh, more broadly, just uh, the, the various technology and telecom issues? Uh, and then the second question, um, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll start with that one. Well, give me your second one, too. I forgot it, actually. So <laughs> I was, was going to let you answer why well, I remembered that's it. The, that's the one I have an answer for. <laughs> <Now> the, <laughs> there are a lot of good members 
that have a strong interest in telecommunications. Uh, on the Democratic side, Mike Doyle from Pennsylvania, Doris Matsui from uh, Nor Sacramento, Northern California, uh, uh, and I'm sure there are people I'm forgetting. I should have a list in front of me of all the members. On uh, the, the Republican side, there are a number of people who have been vo involved, although Lee Terry, who had been very involved, is not going to be returning uh, this next year. But I think it will uh, draw a lot of interest, and we have a number of new members that are being added to the committee, and some of them may want to throw themselves into the communications policy area, especially since so many of the other areas uh, are going to be so difficult. Uh, certainly important, but very difficult to um, work together and pass legislation. I remember the other question. Um, after the president um, <laughs> issued his opinion on, on net neutrality, there was, um, interestingly, a lot of immediate visceral reaction from the Republicans uh, after he said that, uh, many of whom really had no idea what net neutrality was. Um, I, I happen to be a Republican, so I'm not throwing them under the bus, but um, I'm just curious if you think that, you know, particularly given the fact that certainly in the 96 Act, when I happened to be on the Hill at the same time when we did that, when we did that bill, generally speaking, we've done these bills in a bipartisan way, as you mentioned, but given the visceral reaction from the Republicans on, on net neutrality, do you see any way for us to do a bill or even parts of a bill that don't get really in the weeds on, on uh, the partisan side of things? I'm sure they don't. They, they don't get in the weeds on the partisan side of things just because the president, the current president happens to be against it, all the Southern Republicans have to be, or for well, have, why do they have to be against it? We have a pattern in the last six years, whatever President Obama is for, the Republicans are against. And uh, that may sound like a glib statement, but he inherited an economy that was in the tank and even when Republican economists were saying we needed a stimulus when the president proposed it, they were against it. We have for decades been talking about what to do about those people who couldn't buy health insurance because they had pre-existing conditions. And the president took a previous Republican idea of a marketplace of private insurers, giving the consumers a choice. And once he proposed it, they were against it. Uh, problems in the banking community. Dodd-Frank became the uh, way to reform it. Republicans didn't want to be part of it, and that became partisan. So uh, it's almost as if whatever the president wants to say he's for, we get an immediate reaction. Um, he's not going to be up for re-election. He's got a Republican Congress. They can draw the lines but I think the danger in drawing lines of they're against whatever Obama wants is raise, will raise the question, well, what do the Republicans want to do? On health care, they wanted to repeal and replace. If they want to repeal and replace net neutrality, what do they want to do with it? They do have a difference of opinion on, uh, uh, on the, the amount of regulation that should go into uh, the, the law in a lot of areas. But sometimes regulation is needed so you can have competition and openness in the marketplace. So I don't know uh, how to answer the question. It would be one where people would have to sort it out and see if there is a spot in where they can come together. But I, 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 in, the, in, in, the, in favor of the Republicans, they didn't like net neutrality before President Obama talked about it. So it wasn't just a visceral reaction to his remarks. Yes, over here. You, the, you, oh, there, there's a questioner over here. Do you want to bring the mic? Oh, you have somebody there. Okay, whatever you, you're in charge. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but for, first off, uh, of course, thank you for your uh, for your service to this country. Um, secondly, there's a school of thought that thinks that uh, a market-based solution to net neutrality would be uh, simply paying for consumption. So you know, dollars per megabit. <coughs> Um, the, the carrier, therefore, doesn't care uh, what content is carried through the pipe just uh, so long as content travels through the pipe. Um, I guess in theory, you know, if I drive my car over the George Washington Bridge, I'll pay $17. If I drive an 18-wheeler, I'll pay $100. Um, I, I guess just kind of your reaction uh, to that, does that mm -hmm. ring any alarms in terms of uh, disadvantaging lower-income citizens or, or anything like that? Well, you have 
two areas where people can pay. They can pay when they're receiving the programming, and uh, uh, that, that, that happens in, in a lot of areas of telecommunications, but you have people who want to be on the Internet, and if you're asking Yahoo to pay a price for it or Netflix to pay a price for it, that's not going to be a problem for them, but if it's a new enterprise that's just getting started, uh, a financial barrier may make it difficult, if not impossible, for them to get started. So I worry about that. I think the idea of uh, other alternatives than a, f than a net neutrality have uh, been talked about, but have not, uh, not caught on. Okay, one last question right here. Uh, so Hi, Congressman. We've Hi. seen a lot of um, movement from uh, Republicans moving, you know, bills to say no Title II or, um, you know, things of that nature. I'm just wondering um, whether you can help us gauge the appetite now for um, legislation, legislating net neutrality uh, as a, on a standalone basis, um, not necessarily folded into a ComAct update or anything like that. When we uh, put together the net neutrality uh, position, in um, the Republicans were just taking over in 2010. It was the end of the year. We had hoped that they would have gone along with it, but they didn't want to legislate. Now, if they want to legislate, uh, they're going to have to um, um, see if they can come up with something that uh, can reach, that could uh, win supporters from across the aisle. And um, not only is it a problem of of legislating, it's also legislating in light of a rule that the FCC may adopt. So for those of us who believe in net neutrality, we take a look at what the FCC has in place versus what the Republicans want to propose as an alternative to see whether it uh, is an alternative that meets all of our concerns. And um, we'll have to wait and see. I think Anna Eshoo, as the uh, ranking Democrat on the uh, Telecommunications Committee, has felt very strongly and supportive of the idea of net neutrality, have, as have most Democrats. I'm not sure why it's become a partisan issue, uh, but to a great extent at this point, it, it, it is a partisan issue. Can, can and I we have to see if that partisan divide can be uh, bridged. Yes? Sorry, I just wanted to trouble you for one more question. Can we get one more question? From you or someone else? Yeah, it's actually from me. So can we get one more? <laughs> I, I, okay, yes. So um, Since you're the reason I'm here, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> um, you know, you said this is your last, uh, your, potentially your last speak as a member of Congress, and, you know, we've got a, a great opportunity to um, ask you one question. What is the legacy that you want to be remembered for? It doesn't have to be about telecom, but as, as a legislator, um, for such a long time and such a distinguished career, mm -hmm. what do you want to be remembered for? I think that uh, I'd like people to know that I start off believing that government can and must play an important role to help people in this country. And uh, without government involvement, we don't give everybody a fair chance. If they don't, can't get health care as a child, if they can't get education, I, we've got to give people a, a full opportunity to succeed to the greatest extent possible. And government uh, has to be there to help those who need help the most, particularly those who are disabled or cannot compete in a competitive uh, country. Uh, I worked for a long time on legislation and I'm very proud of my legislative record, a lot of people look at that legislation now that it's law and say, that makes sense. Who would dispute it? From simple laws like nutrient information when you shop and look at the labels to know whether it fits with your power empowerment to decide your own diet, to stopping smoking in public places, to making sure that we have competition in the pharmaceutical area or the clean air law, which regulates uh, air pollution, which has, could cause so many adverse health consequences. 
And people look at it and say, of course, that makes sense. But it took years, even for the labeling law to pass. It took years to come up with the Ryan White Act to address the HIV AIDS epidemic and a lot of obstacles. But when we finally got the law in place so that it, uh, the bill in place to become law, uh, we had bipartisan agreement. Sometimes that was because we had Republicans with us in the beginning, and sometimes it was because we listened to what they had to say, took a lot of their suggestions, which made it a better law than it, uh, the original proposal. So uh, my message is government can make a difference. Government is important. I reject the idea that we don't need government. We need government. We need government to act in the interests of the American people. There is a public interest that has to be uh, acknowledged and respected and acted uh, to protect. So uh, that would be my broad legacy. And then if you ask me to choose between my different bills, uh, I'm proud of all of them. From the major bills to the minor bills, I think they've all made a difference. So I thank you for asking me. Thank you. We'll take another 15-minute break, and then we'll reconvene. <laughs>